So we'll get started. Okay, so good, good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to our tree mortality and land management webinar. I'm Tracy Cleveland. I am the Napa County Ag Commissioner. Um, I'm not a speaker today, but my office kind of helped sort of facilitate this, um, this webinar event. So we'd, um, it, it, we're kind of, we're calling it a collaboration, an educational collaboration between the Napa County Resource Conservation District, USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service, University of California Cooperative Extension and CAL FIRE. Um, so the intent for this webinar is really to be a resource for landowners um, experiencing tree mortality and, and issues with damage on their properties. Um, so I'm going to let each of the speakers introduce themselves. Um, and at the end, we have a good amount of time for a Q&A session. So if you have questions, you can put them in the chat box. You can also raise your hand during the Q&A portion. We'll try to keep track of questions that way. Um, a little bit of housekeeping. Um, please be sure to keep yourself on mute. You can also turn off your cameras and kind of focus on the speaker. Um, let's see. Uh, and we are actually recording this webinar in order to make it a resource for folks later that couldn't attend um, live this evening. So be sure to spread the word. Um, and without further ado, I think we should get started. I'm going to kick it over to Mike Jones, who is a forest advisor with UC Cooperative Extension. Well, thanks, Tracy. Uh, good evening, everybody, and, and thank you all for being here. Uh, as, as Tracy mentioned, my name is Michael Jones. I am the UC Extension Forester for Mendocino Lake and Sonoma counties, um, but I, I, do, I work a lot in Napa County as well, um, helping our, some of my colleagues um, in, in, in the county. Um, we have a lot of great people in the presentation tonight, and I'm going to start out with kind of an overview of basically the, uh, the outbreak and the conifer mortality, kind of the ecology, the science behind it. And um, I'm going to share my screen, so we'll get, let me give, give me a second for that to start up. Um, as I'm sure you all know that, you know, these kinds of presentations are really a collaborative effort and a lot of work from, from my colleagues went into kind of making this presentation and the content that I'm going to present. So um, a big thanks to um, Curtis Ewing and Chris Lee, who are Forest Health Special Cal Fire. They will be introducing themselves in detail at the Q&A where they'll be helping to answer questions um, at that time. Um, and then we will have our other presenters introduce themselves at their session just to keep it a little bit more streamlined and, and um, you know, you make sure you don't forget who they are when, it, when they're speaking. So um, what I'm going to be talking about is bark beetles and conifer mortality. So this is a very broad general topic. Um, and we're specifically interested in you know, what's happening in Napa County, in particular neighborhoods like Ingwin and, and Polk Valley, where the mortality that we're currently um, observing is, is pretty, pretty significant. Um, but this is a regional issue. And, and I'll certainly be talking more about how, how we're, we certainly are uh, looking at um, quite an extensive amount of conifer mortality and, and can expect more to come. So I, I was um, contextualized my presentations. I'm I'm also going to turn my camera off because I have stream uh, um, streaming issues. So um, hi, bye. Um, so I start with I, I always contextualize this conversation because we can kind of just talk about bark beetles in the abstract, and it doesn't really help us understand what the actual dynamics of the infestation are and why it's occurring. And so a couple of really key elements that I start out with and we have to think about that's really important when we talk about forest health and, and when we have insect disease issues in our forest ecosystems. It's first of all that forests are dynamic. I know we like to think that they're fixed, right? We just see green trees and that's kind of the way they've always been, but forests are extremely dynamic, competitive and all kinds of cool things happening um, that we can't really see because they exist on a different time scale than we do. So that's important to key here. It's not a symbiotic, everything's static. It's very dynamic, things are changing constantly. Uh, a part of that dynamic nature is disturbance. Disturbance is incredibly important. We'll talk more about disturbances because insects and diseases are a type of natural disturbance, uh, biotic disturbance, and we'll we'll talk a little bit about that um, and why they're important. And you know, in they can be good for the and really they are good for the forest ecosystem. But when there's human interactions with the forest and those disturbances, that they can be bad, and how we frame that. Um, and lastly, that dead trees are important. So when we're talking about the conifer mortality we're experiencing, it's not that we're trying to eliminate dead trees from the landscape completely. They're extremely important part of the healthy forest ecosystem. 
And we need them in these forests. It's when they become more abundant and concentrated that in areas that we value for different reasons that we then have to think about what that means to our interaction with that forest. So disturbance, um, right? Disturbances can be abiotic, meaning that they are weather, um, right? These are interesting examples. They don't always apply to California, but they are certainly factors that, that, that I would think about when we think about forest ecology. Climate, it's a huge one, climate change. Drought, we are all experiencing drought right now. That's gonna come back. We're gonna talk about that. Fire, we're gonna come talk about that. And then I just keep the asteroids in there because it is a type of disturbance. It is a very fun type of disturbance. If you've had, ever heard of Tung Tunguska, which was an asteroid, I think it was an asteroid, um, in early 1900s it impacted Siberia um, in, in the middle of nowhere in Russia. It leveled, I don't remember exactly how big it was, 8 million hectares or something like that of, of forests in, in, in milliseconds. So it's a rather cool type of disturbance. It's not very common, but does exist. And then biotic disturbance, right? So if abiotic, biotic, we are certainly, we could argue about this, but as humans, we are certainly a biotic source of disturbance um, through land management um, practices, the changes in land use, the expansion of the wildland urban interface. Really important one that we'll come back and we'll talk more about is fire suppression, climate change, animals. And then we're really gonna focus on in detail tonight are insects and diseases are extremely important. I wanna make sure I say that for my forest pathologist, but tonight we're gonna to focus on insects. And so, um, right, this is a very complicated dynamic system where there's a lot of factors at play and we're gonna talk about a lot of stuff and how they all interact. So when we think about insects as disturbance, we look at it from two perspectives. We have the ecological perspective where they're important natural disturbance and they have a lot of, this is just kind of like your cherry picked example of what role they have in forest ecosystems. They create canopy gaps by killing trees. They alter forest structure by changing age class and having regeneration and killing big trees and letting small trees grow in that space. They enhance vegetation and wildlife diversity. Think about if you have lots of big trees and small trees, you have different habitat types. Um, they nutrient cycle, so they, they break down those really strong cellulose and lignin carbons. Um, they help that decay process and return that cycle, nutrient cycling. Their food sources, woodpeckers love, they thrive in bark beetle bricks because they love eating the larva. From a utilitarian perspective, so from us, right, our perspective, they are pests. And they're pests because we're competing for economic resources, right? So we're directly competing for a resource, and we can talk about and think about what all those means. But for example, if you'd like to recreate in the forest and a lot of your trees that in the forest that you go are dead, that's a direct competition with your value of that forest. So it's really important to think about these from both perspectives because insects are really important disturbances, but when they get to a certain condition in which we're competing with them, then we have to think about these economic impacts and these thresholds that we're willing to accept before we do management or where we accept the mortality as kind of part of the system. Lastly, this is really important as well, that typically, and I would say most of the time, native, right? It's really important that we specify these are native insects, uh, native forest pests um, are secondary pests, meaning they're not the usually the initial cause of a mortality event. They're usually coming into play because something else is already happening to the trees and they're just finishing them off. They're, most vis they're the most visible and the most kind of the thing that we focus on, but really they're kind of filling their ecological role of helping to cull out those dying trees and recycle those nutrients and all the things that we talked about. So they're not typically, a the native insects are not typically primary pests in forest systems. They are secondary, meaning they come in after other disturbances. So, right, we talked about a lot about the disturbance. And, and so it's typically when we see these disturbances, lots of dis disturbances align that we get conditions like we're experiencing now. So for example, we have been experiencing or probably likely going to continue experiencing pretty significant, significant drought, event, drought events. And um, we couple that with fire suppression, right? And we'll talk about why that's important. And then now we have these extreme, large, high severity wildfire behavior. We're creating lots of fire stressed dying trees, which is candy for bark beetles. And when we have all these disturbances come together, then we can lead to things like we're experiencing now with this landscape scale tree mortality, where we're having lots of trees a lot across the landscape starting to die out. And we're gonna, this is what we're gonna talk about for the rest of my talk and the rest of tonight. But I just wanna point out, which I think is just really cool, is it's really, I love this picture, the inset on the upper left. This is uh, not one of our beetles that we've talked about. This is a mountain pine beetle. This is a matchstick. 
And so it's just kind of really crazy to think that an insect that's approximately, and in multiple insects that are approximately the size of a match head can, and can have such significant impacts on our forests. Um, it's, it's rather spectacular in a scientific perspective, I guess. All right. And, and as I mentioned, this is not just specific to Napa County or Lake County, this is regional. So all the Mayacamas up in the Mendocino National Forest, and I'm sure other areas that it's just starting to show up, we're experiencing a pretty significant mortality event in our conifers. And so while not quite to the same scale or extent, we are currently experiencing our own mini version of the Sierra mortality that they experienced a few years ago during the last significant drought. Um, and so this is something that we're gonna have to pay attention to and think about moving forward. All right, so what are, our, what are, the, are currently, what are our species that are impacted? Um, so we, here we have uh, our species listed on the, on the left, and then we have kind of a rough range map on the right. And this is gonna, I'll talk about why that, that's important that we look at the range. Um, so pretty much all of our dominant, uh, dominant, sorry, not the right term, all of our more common um, conifers that occur in the coastal forest are currently being impacted. So ponderosa pine, which I know is a, up in Angwin, that's a, a pretty significant tree species. Douglas fir is pretty significant. Um, and so here's the range for ponderosa. Here's the range for Douglas fir. We have gray pine and knobcone pine. We think of those occurring at maybe lower quality drier sites, but they are susceptible too. And so, you know, when they start going, they're pretty tough trees when they start going that there's some issues that we're kind of experiencing. And so what's really important about these range maps you'll notice is that, you know, we're kind of the, there's these fingers of, this, of, of habitat where these trees occur in Napa County. And that really is pretty important because if you think about a tree species right in the middle of its range where it's a large contiguous area of a suitable growing site, those trees are pretty happy. Um, but here our trees are growing in these kind of marginal sites, if you will, or kind of exposed areas where they're you know, quickly, you change topography and elevation and kind of exposure, and you lose the site quality that supports these tree species, and particularly ponderosa pine and dug fir, right? Right, gray pine and knob cone can occur on some really, really harsh sites. But because of this, they're very susceptible to, to these changes in, in the environment. Um, in addition to that, because they occur in these kind of edge or kind of fingers in these areas where a little bit more exposed, um, they've been kind of part of this fire suppression era where uh, we've removed a regular fire return interval through natural and native California burning. And under that regime where you have regular fire in these systems, the hardwoods do favorably, right? So we preferentially select for the oaks essentially when we have fire in regular interval. When we remove fire from these systems, the natural process of succession favors the conifers. And so we might even have, even though we're in the range of these trees, we might have expansion of their growing area into areas that weren't traditionally supporting conifers. And these sites, these are usually considered lower quality sites for the species, meaning they're, they're, they can grow there, they will grow there, but they're just not as hardy. And so now we have trees kind of on the edge of their, of the local range, they're expanding through fire suppression, so they're encroaching into other habitats. And now we add drought and these trees are already significantly stressed. And now you can, you know, you can kind of see how we set up the conditions for what we're experiencing with the bark beetles. So how do we know that bark beetles are the, the at play in these trees? Well, we can identify them pretty easily from the canopy decline. That's pretty significant kind of distance from a distance. We're like, oh yeah, something's wrong with that tree. And when we get closer, we can look at things like pitch tubes, which are really cool. Um, conifers main mechanisms, mechanism of defense against insects and diseases are to literally force them out with pitch. Right, so sticky sap. Just think of like uh, Jurassic Park with the mosquito and amber. Same idea, right? The tree is pitching, the insect uh, gets trapped in that, gets pushed out of the hole as it's, you know, the, the adults are trying to bore into the tree and if the tree is pitching out, they're pushing out and they get encapsulated and they get pushed out, expelled or killed. Um, think about what that means if the tree is water stressed, right? So we'll, we'll talk about that some more, but essentially when you have a lot of water stressed trees, they're not as well um, suited for resisting these attacks. Uh, successful attacks can be determined by, in this photo on the bottom left, we can see where there's actually wood boring dust in the pitch, meaning that beetle successfully got through that defensive mechanism and is feeding in that tree. So we can use pitch tubes, they're very visible once you get close. Then we look at galleries. So this is kind of when we get really nerdy about entomology and identifying, identifying particular species of bark beetles and wood boring insects. We look at their galleries or their feeding tunnels and that helps us identify them. And then we have really interesting 
some of these beetles vector um, uh, fungus and they can infect the tree as well. And that's usually a sign. So here's blue stain. And a lot of you maybe have heard of blue stain um, in these in conifers. So that's how we know that's the bark beetles, right? We've seen these symptoms and my colleagues and I have been out sampling these trees and have consistently found these issues. So where are the insects that we're currently kind of at play in this outbreak? Um, they're all very cool. I think they're pretty cute, but I'm an entomologist, so I'm a weirdo. But we have Western pine beetle, which is a pretty common widespread bark beetle, likes ponderosa pine. It attacks um, stressed trees. Hey, we set up those conditions and it can mass attack. We'll talk about what that means in a second. We have red turpentine beetle, pretty cool beetle, pretty big beetle. Again, it likes pines. Um, and, and both of these insects uh, really like fire stress ponderosa pine. And um, then we have ips. Um, these are cute little insects usually attack the tops of trees. And I should mention that bark beetles will um, divide up a tree and attack different portions of a tree. So the bigger it is, they usually like bigger stems, the main trunk, those areas. So the smaller it is, they'll hit the branches and stuff. But anyway, so we have several ips species that Chris and Curtis, Cal Fire colleagues, have identified. These guys are pretty cute. We identify them by the number and shape um, of spines on their butt. And so we know that we have um, a couple species that play here. They like Western pine species and they infest slash. And so that's a, this is tricky for bark beetle management because when you're doing thinning work or you're doing any kind of forest management work, you create green waste. That green waste is susceptible to, to bark beetles, right? In particular, these hip species. And they can infest that cut material and then move back into the tree. So that's pretty kind of not preferential, right? If you're trying to reduce the stand density or improve the health of these trees and you're creating slash that is then making your trees vulnerable, that's a pretty significant issue. So that comes into play really, really importantly when we're thinking about managing for bark beetle outbreaks. And then lastly, we have our flattened fir borer and dug fir engraver. These are in our, our dug fir um, it's in other firs. We don't have true fir in the area that we're talking about, but these are kind of like our common uh, bark beetles that we have in our Douglas fir. So these are insects that we're currently experiencing. How do we get to an outbreak? So as I mentioned, we have, and remember these things are like the size of little match heads, so they're tiny. So how do we get to the point where they're killing trees across the landscape? So we have an example of disturbance. So say a wildfire, it creates, you know, some of the trees will die, but then it also fire stress. Some trees get damaged, they don't die, but they're stressed out. The bark beetles love these trees, they infest those trees. They build up their populations. Now, with healthy forest ecosystems, the disturbance would be limited to the fire footprint and the bark beetles would just cull out those dead dying trees and then their populations would disperse. But because we have landscape level forest health issues, when we have a fire, the bark beetle populations build up. Now there's lots of trees all around them because of fire suppression. So we have higher density of the trees, they're water stressed because of drought and they're competing with each other. So they're technically not really healthy, even though they're green, they're very stressed. The bark beetles can sense this, they attack those trees. So now your populations are spreading from your fire footprints into your surrounding areas. This is where they start mass attacking trees. So what happens is the bark beetles find a, a tree that they really like. And this is it's a really cool biology and I'm not gonna go into too much in, to, to do too much detail because it, it's, uh, I can nerd out on this for a while, but basically what happens is they use these communication pheromones and they'll, they'll tell the females will say, hey, check it out, this tree is pretty awesome. If we all attack it at one time, we'll overwhelm its defenses, see all these pitch tubes and um, successfully colonize it. And so they can mass attack even relatively healthy trees in some instances and, and cause mortality that way. But now our populations are exponentially building up and they're getting more and more. And now we can get to kind of this landscape level mortality where we have trees across whole areas starting to, to kind of become infested and, and slowly die. Um, this is just kind of a theoretical outbreak dynamic. Remember the, these beetles grow exponentially, their populations grow exponentially. And so we really started monitoring mortality a few years ago. And, and as best as I can guess across the region, not specific to Napa or any area in particular, but kind of on average, where we are currently um, spring 2020 is what we call the incipient or the, the initial stages of the infestation. And based on this theoretical modeling from a lot of research that we can unfortunately expect a, a fairly significant increase in conifer mortality over the next few years. I hope I'm wrong, but the, the, based on the current population dynamics and the condition of these forest systems that, you know, it's, it's, it's fairly predictable that this is where we're going. And maybe Lake County is a case study for that kind of expected mortality where they have fairly significant 
a conifer mortality in bark beetle populations occurring right now. So how do we manage for bark beetles, right? I think this is really important. The first thing I want to mention here is that the current infestation is going to run its course, and there's nothing we can really do about that. We can eradicate the bark beetles at this point. There's millions of them on the landscape. There's hundreds and thousands of trees already infested. And so we're really just, this thing is going to run its course. But what we're going to do is strategize and prioritize management areas, high priority areas. And we're going to use multiple tools to do that, right? So an integrated approach where we're going to think about what is the highest value and why are we interested in managing trees in this particular area, and then use our suite of tools to then implement management. First and foremost, we're thinking about removing dead trees. There's lots of dead trees in the landscape already. If they present a hazard to life or property, they should probably be removed if possible. And we need to get that hazard out of there because um, it also becomes a, a fuel for wildfire behavior. Dead trees don't spontaneously combust. So it's not that having dead trees in the landscape make fires happen, it's that they can significantly influence fire behavior. So having lots of dead trees in high strategic and strategic areas like within the WUI or areas where we're trying to think about controlling wildfire behavior is not always the greatest thing. So thinking about how we're going to remove those trees in high value areas. And now if we're managing for current infested trees um, in areas where the bark beetle populations are active and they're killing trees, then we need to remove and destroy infested material. And what that looks like is, remember, the dead trees are dead. The bark beetles aren't there. They don't really care about that stuff. The dead trees are now a hazard or a fuel, and that's what we're worried about from a societal perspective. What we're focusing on the trees that are currently infested, where the bark beetle populations are currently feeding and building up. And those are the trees that if we're trying to minimize either a local outbreak, like a smaller scale outbreak, or trying to minimize the so the spread or the impact in a particular area, like a campground or something like that, then we want to focus on removing the trees that are showing symptoms and, and starting to show decline. We destroy that material to remove those bark beetle populations. And we also at the same time thin the surrounding forest to improve the vigor of the remaining trees and really try to suppress that outbreak, if you will. We're not eradicating it, re eradicating it, remember, but we're trying to suppress the bark beetle populations. Thinning is ultimately the best tool we have. And thinning really should occur before bark beetles uh, outbreaks begin, um, because we want to improve the vigor and health of our trees to make it so that bark beetle populations can establish and spread on the landscape. Remember that if we're going to thin, which is really crucial, and how you thin and how many trees per acre or what you're thinning to really depends on a lot of different factors. But the idea is that you reduce that competition, you create more space so the trees are healthier, have more access to water, reduce that competition. And then we remove and destroy that slash so we prevent accidentally infesting our trees. This is the best tool we have. This is how we prevent bark beetle outbreaks from occurring. There's a lot of other beneficial uh, aspects of thinning, like reducing that fuel loading and spacing trees out so that we can change fire behavior uh, during wildfire events. Insecticides can be used. Um, they are typically are best for preventing trees from becoming infested. Um, it, it's typically we use a, a, a topical um, insecticide, meaning that the entire outer structure of the bark, anywhere a bark beetle might bore into, has to be treated. Um, as you can imagine, that's fairly expensive. There might be some unintended consequences of doing a lot of topical insecticide applications. Um, but they do work, um, and it's important to also recognize that it's not a one and done. It's something that has to be done every year or two. Um, systemic insecticides, those that are injected into the tree, are generally not as effective against bark beetles. And I think the main reason why, just in terms of this conversation, that they don't work is systemic insecticides work well because they're translocated by the tree into the vulnerable tissues. If you're water stressed, you're not moving that insecticide as effectively. And so you have reduced capacity to, to, for the efficacy. Uh, as I mentioned, bark beetles use pheromones to communicate. We've learned to synthesize those pheromones for some bark beetle species, and we can use them to disrupt their communication. Unfortunately, our major species, there are not a lot of pheromone options or really any for most of them available on the market. So while that is a cool and, and kind of interesting way to think about management, doesn't necessarily apply for us. Also, it's very spotty on its effect, its efficacy. Um, uh, supplemental watering, just like insecticides, um, is an option for high value trees, right? These are trees that we really highly value, don't want to die, uh, and we're protecting them for some important reason. Uh, again, it has to be very selective, and we're thinking about what that means because these trees require lots and lots of water and what kind of conflicting uh, use of that water we might be in, in, envisioning. 
Um, and then areas where we've had pretty extensive mortality. Um, remember, we talked about how through fire expression, we've had conifer encroachment into, into sites that are not as high quality for conifers. And so maybe we're thinking about planting non-susceptible host species, maybe more hardy conifers, or maybe in some cases, because it is for encroachment or conifer encroachment, we're planting back hardwoods like oaks and thinking about how we kind of can create a more resilient structure to disturbance and future climate change impacts. And just as kind of wrapping up, um, just because you know this is this is a really important part uh, or issue right now as well. Um, you know our conifers are extremely susceptible. Remember, you know their main mechanism of defense is to physically push a bark beetle out of a tree through through pitching, and so when they're water stressed, they're much more vulnerable to bark beetle to bark beetle attacks, especially when those bark beetle populations build up. But our hardwoods have the same issues. They're just much more resilient and, and, and kind of well adapted and evolved to deal with, with forest pests. Our oaks in particular are extremely tough. But they also get water stress from drought. They also deal with competition. And think about you have fur encroachment. It's not just the conifers that are struggling and competing for resources, but sort of the oaks. And so when our oaks get stressed and they become drought stressed and through the same reasons that I was talking about conifers, they can also get bark beetle issues. So a native issue that we have is Western oak bark beetle. It's, it loves drought stressed trees. It's vectoring this kind of disease called foamy bark canker. Um, and so we're seeing kind of limited pockets of mortality in California black oak interior live oak. Um, it's also in coast live oak. And so that's something to keep an eye out. And then in Napa County, because we're in Napa County and specifically this is something that Chris a lot of us who are hosting this, this webinar are also working on is a, a, a recently detected invasive um, insect called the Mediterranean oak borer. It is feeding on valley oak and blue oak. We, we don't know a lot about it. We're still researching it and studying it, but I'm, I'm, it certainly is going to be um, you know, something we'll look at the dynamics between forest health and this particular invasive insect and the impact it will have. So, um, this, you know, bark beetles and conifer mortality is, just, is an extremely well studied system, particularly in the Sierra where there's forest surface land, the Rockies and, and nationwide. Um, so there's a lot of great resources available for understanding these kinds of population dynamics and bark beetles and how to manage for them. Uh, uh, so um, these resources are here, we can post them in the chat or maybe even a follow up, uh, I guess maybe in the chat, but there's a lot of great information and we'll have a, you know, we'll continue to have a conversation now about this. And, and one thing that I haven't talked at all about is financial resources, um, but that's for our next guest. So uh, thank you for your time. What I'm going to do is we'll save questions for the Q&A. Um, I will post some of the resources that I just presented in the chat box and um, make that available for folks. But what I'd like to move over to is to talk with our NRCS and RCD colleagues who will introduce themselves. Uh, I think you guys can choose who speaks first and how you do that, but they're gonna talk about the resources that are available to landowners because this is, those of you who are actively stewarding your lands know this is under healthy forest conditions. It's, it's expensive and tedious, but um, this presents a whole new challenge and, and they have some information to kind of help you think about how to go about this. So Erica and uh, Amanda, when you're ready, take it away. Great, thanks, Mike. That was super informative. Thank you very much for giving us an overview on that. Um, so hi everyone, my name is Erica Valik. I am a soil conservationist with the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service. And I'm going to be talking a little bit about financial assistance programs today. And then I have Amanda Benton from the Napa Resource Conservation District following my talk uh, also about financial assistance that may be available to you. So let me um, turn off my camera just to save some bandwidth and I'll share my screen real quick. Okay, can, and can someone confirm that we, we see that? You're great. Yes. Yeah, great. we got it, Amanda. Great, okay, thank you everyone. Okay, so we'll talk a little bit about the federal financial assistance programs that are available to you um, as local landowners in Napa. And I just wanna reinforce that these financial assistance programs are available to you to apply for, they are competitive, but we also have a really knowledgeable staff and we work closely with Cal University of California, Cooperative Extension with CAL FIRE, with the Napa RCD, and we can connect you with resources as well as make site visits if you are interested in that as well. 
So let's begin by talking about these, some of these financial assistance programs. So there are two main programs offered through the NRCS, which is federal funding. The first is known as the Environmental Quality Incentives Program, also known as EQIP. So the main goal behind this program is to create a conservation plan with you as the landowner that addresses environmental concerns at your property. So generally, one of our NRCS staff will visit your property and work with you to go around your property, identify various environmental concerns, and make a conservation plan map that we can use to help you apply for some of these programs. Another program that we have is the Conservation Stewardship Program. And this is really considered a stepping stone between the initial EQIP program and it's really made to build on your existing conservation plan and man maintain these conservation practices, furthering, further enhancing your agriculture operation and really just keeping up on what you've already established through EQIP or perhaps through another funding source or, or even on your own. And so the main way that these programs work is that they target environmental concerns on your property. So like I mentioned, we'll come out to your property, we would look around with you and identify some environmental concerns. These can range anywhere from with soil, it could be sheet and rill erosion or gully erosion like we see in that picture below. And then it also goes into plants, looking at plant productivity and health. And this is really also looking at what Mike was talking about. How are the trees looking? Are they healthy? Do they look like they're being attacked by various pests and beetles? And then another environmental concern is specifically plant pest pressure. This can range from invasive species to um, beetles and other pests that you may see in your forest. We also have plant structure and composition, looking at the overall forest health. What is the diversity of the species, their height and their layering in the forest? And then finally, something we're always concerned with in Napa right now is wildfire hazard from biomass accumulation. Now, if you have livestock on your property, another option is inadequate, um, sorry, I'm, it's covered, livestock water quantity, quality, and distribution. So we can help you if you have livestock already on your property to get proper uh, water distributed through them throughout the property so that you can maybe enhance a prescribed grazing system on your property. And then if we're really focusing on wildlife, terrestrial habitat for wildlife and invertebrates um, is also a common environmental resource concern that we see out there. Oh, so we're just going to specifically, you know, focus on forest health and these uh, resource concerns that we see here. So if we move specifically into forests and looking at forests on your property, the first step is to make a forest management plan or an FMP. A forest management plan is a site-specific plan which, which addresses one or more environmental concerns on land where forestry related practices will be planned. Now what an FMP looks like is it has really many different components. It has different maps looking at um, soils, at maybe the, the fuel load on your property, but it focuses specifically on the resource inventory of the existing conditions, the desired future conditions, and then it will have these various maps looking at treatments as well as others, other maps that may provide more information on your property. Now in California, there are a few ways to obtain a forest management plan. And the most common forest management plan in the state is the California Cooperative Forest Management Plan, which is written by a registered professional forester. Now this plan is not something that all landowners have and it is, can be quite expensive to get. So if you are interested in applying for one of our NRCS programs, it is possible that an NRCS employee who is not a registered professional forester can write a forest management plan for your forested property. Now, this is generally limited to a property that is less than 50 acres, that has less than 50 acres of forested land, or if it was impacted by a wildfire in the last five years and it's less than 5,000 acres. So those are the two caveats for the size of the property that we can write a forest management plan for. Um, and that's specifically limited just because the NRCS is, we don't have registered professional foresters in the Napa office, but we can um, get advice from those uh, that we have on staff. 
Now, if your property falls outside of those limitations, it is possible that we can apply for uh, fi federal financial assistance through one of our programs to have a technical service provider through the NRCS write a California Cooperative Forest Management Plan for you. So if you don't have a forest management plan and you fall outside of these limitations, we can help you apply to have one written for you. Now, once you have a forest management plan, this is really where we then want to implement different forest management treatments. And like Mike mentioned, the first one that we generally look at is forest thinning or forest stand improvement, which is what NRCS generally calls it. And this is just some pictures and I'll have some pictures as we proceed through the slideshow of projects that we've seen in Napa County. So really reducing the number of trees per acre, uh, reducing the amount of fuel load that's on the forest floor, reducing the number of trees so that if a fire does come through here, it's not carried through the canopy and creating these massive wildfires we see today, but then also improving the forest health of the overall forest. We can also include tree shrub pruning um, in the forest if there is a need for that. And just some examples of pictures of that here. And then after all of this woody residue is taken down, we have to do something with it. So there are some options for including lop and scatter, chipping or hand pile burning to dispose of the woody residue um, that you have now taken down. Some other things that we can include in a conservation plan based on the environmental concerns are brush management. And this is um, removing or attempting to control invasive woody species on the property. And so looking at removing some eucalyptus trees or um, hand pulling French broom, that's something that we can include and provide financial compensation for. Sometimes this is just hand pulling or cutting down the eucalyptus. It may also be spot spraying or really targeting the stumps of these species with an herbicide to keep them from re-sprouting. So different, different options that we have that we would look at at your property with you. And then one other thing that has become a little bit more common in Napa is prescribed grazing um, in the understory of forests and oak woodlands as well as other for forests to reduce fuel load. Uh, this is primarily, primarily with temporary electric fence and then rotating animals following a prescribed grazing plan to reduce fuel load and make sure animals aren't concentrated in one area for too long. So those are examples of different conservation practices we can plan at your property and include in your application. Um, but how does this all work and what is the timeline? So generally, if you're interested in including an application in our in our funding for uh, federal financial assistance. The first thing that we want you to remember is that we accept applications on a rolling basis. We don't have set deadlines right now. They're usually announced at the beginning of each fiscal year in October. So right now we don't have a deadline and we accept applications on a rolling basis. After we get your application, we can develop a conservation plan for you that addresses these environmental concerns and it meets your objectives. It's your land and we don't want to encourage you to do something that you're not comfortable with. We just want to discuss it with you and find the best solution. So we would develop a plan with you together. After we have your application and your conservation plan, uh, your application is ranked and placed in various fund pools throughout the state and within our local area. This ranking is based on how many environmental concerns you're addressing on your land, and then as well as the diversity of practices that you're including in that conservation plan in your application. Our funding selections usually occur between March and August of each year. And if you are funded, your contract goes through a biological and archeological review. So once you're funded, it can often be several months before we can um, come out and again, encourage you to begin work. You may need to wait for these reviews to occur. And then the contracts are usually planned over three years so that there's enough time to complete everything depending on the acreage that we have planned. And our um, practices must be completed to NRCS standards and specifications. 
So we do not require receipts for any of the work being done, but we do require that it's completed to our standards and specs, which is something that we would discuss thoroughly with you and provide written guidance for when your contract is funded or even before then when we're at your property. Great, so if that sounds like something you're interested in, the final thing to consider is eligibility. So the, the basic requirement for a forested property is that there is a forest management plan, and this can either be developed by the NRCS, like I mentioned before, or an outside source from a registered professional forester or through another funding source that has written a FMP for you. Like I mentioned, our um, payment rates, they're a flat rate and they're paid by the acre foot or other unit. We don't require receipts, but it is a flat, flat rate regardless of the actual cost of the practice. Our land eligibility, so the applicant must show land control. This can either be through a deed or lease. Um, and that's just something to keep in mind that we have to show that you have control of the land throughout the contract. And then as far as eligibility, whether the land is under an LLC or trust, we will need all of the documents outlining who is in the LLC and trust and who has signature authority. And then finally, one, uh, one caveat that we have is that the average adjusted gross income must be that less than $900,000 for the three previous taxable years for the applicant who is applying for the program. So thank you very much. Um, my name is Erica Valak. Like I mentioned before, Evelyn Denzine is the district conservationist of Napa County, and we're happy to talk with you on the phone or answer um, your questions through email or on the phone. So thank you and hope to hear from you all. Great. Thanks, Erica. Um, Amanda, are you ready to follow up with the RCV? Yes. Awesome. Hi, everyone. My name is Amanda Benton, and I'm the Forestry Program Manager at the Napa Resource Conservation District. We share an office with the NRCS and obviously a lot of the same letters in our name. So it's understandable when people get us confused, we are slightly different. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about what we do together and what we do separately. So I'm assuming that the screen share is working because it always does. Uh, you're not sharing your screen right now. No. <laughs> of course, of course, this time it doesn't. Let's try. How about now? Yeah, there you go. Okay. Perfect. All right. So the Napa Resource Conservation District is a special district, sort of like a water district. We have basically the boundary of Napa County. Um, we dip into Solano just a smidge along the bay. As the forestry program manager, I deal with mostly the forested lands, but as we have all recognized over the last few years, the forested lands have a huge impact on everything. So what we are talking primarily about is um, you know, we're really trying to get out there and talk to folks about what can happen in forested lands, how they can have an impact, and how, you know, engaging really active management on forested lands helps all of us and, and the forested area as well. Um, we like to geospatially monitor the outcomes of tree planting and fuel management projects, as well as environmental outcomes. We need to understand the survival rate and maintenance needs of planting trees and other ecosystem improvement projects and how forests change with management and climate change, which includes obviously droughts, impacts, and pests. Um, we are not a research institution, but we partner with universities like our fellows at UCCE and um, are working on a few different projects along with PUC here in Napa to you know, facilitate better learning of forested lands. We also work, focus a lot on collaboration and coordination. So working with local partners to uh, help everyone get more involved and engaged. Um, we serve on steering committees for the Napa Pre-Fire Coordinating Group. 
advise in the development of the CW, CWPP, which was the Community Wildfire Protection Plan, and partner with neighboring counties to design and implement landscape level projects because things like fire and insects do not care about our geopolitical boundaries, obviously. Um, we are really focused on a few projects right now that involve capacity building. So working with partners in Yolo, Solano, Calusa, and then also Lake Mendocino and Sonoma counties to bring together those bigger groups and have a bigger impact on a landscape level. And then on a more local personalized level, we do a lot of community engagement and um, outreach to smaller groups. We have a whole um, like education and outreach program that focuses on uh, school children and getting them out planting trees, but also having a better understanding of where trees should be planted and where maybe they shouldn't be planted. Um, we like to bring together students and teachers and community members and professionals through class and field experiences designed to foster engagement and appreciation of Napa County's biodiversity, land use, and ways for all people to connect and protect the environment. And we're really focused on the science behind management activities. So even when I'm talking to folks and their primary concern is wildfire and how to avoid you know, catastrophic wildfire, my focus is always going to be on forest health. Because as Mike explained to us, wildfire is one component that can hurt a forest and that can cause other issues. And, and really the main focus needs to be on sustainable, healthy forests. Which brings us to what managing a forest even means. And that you know, involves identifying the goals and objectives of forest management and what your future needs and uses are going to be of a, of a forest, of a managed forest, and how to create sustainable and healthy forests. Excuse me. There are a few different ways we go about this. Um, Erica and Mike both touched on all of these. And I just think that they're really important, but I'm gonna breeze through them a little bit so we can get to the bigger questions and answers section. Um, this is you know, a good example of the encroachment that Mike spoke of where conifers are maybe moving into an area that they uh, hadn't historically inhabited. So uh, you know, these projects focused on removing conifer encroachment into oak woodlands and how important it is um, when you have you know, to, to get that fuel reduction going. Um, this is especially true in deciduous oak woodlands. We're a little less concerned about the live oaks, but still um, any, any oak woodland encroachment I take personally. And there are a few different methods for getting that done. Uh, commercial thinning, when there's a commercial product out there, which I know is one of the struggles. Um, goats are you know, some of the more adorable methods. Mastication, where the tree is basically chipped in place and obviously um, hand work. So folks out there on the ground with lockers and chainsaws. There are limitations to all of these. Goats are great climbers, masticators, not so much. Humans somewhere in between. So it's just a really, I think, powerful example of how um, treated and untreated forests can respond to the same you know, event. Obviously, this is a wildfire. Um, it was up in Humboldt County, but the you know, treated area on the left, the fire was able to drop out of the crown. It wasn't you know, one of those massive wind-driven wildfires that we experience so regularly. So obviously conditions are gonna change how a fire behaves even when it's been treated. But um, a, you know, a non-homogenous crown is going to have a better survivability even in those types of fires. This is just a great video. That is called a hydroax. Um, it's a type of masticator. And this is clearing out a riparian area from juniper encroachment. So as you can see, there was a tree and now there isn't. The main program that I wanna talk about tonight is called the North Bay Forest Improvement Program. And it functions very similarly to the EQIP program that Erica spoke of. We have focused this program on Napa, Sonoma, Lake, and Mendocino counties. And we're working with the RCDs in Sonoma and Mendocino, and then Clerk in Lake County, which is the Clear Lake Environmental Research Center. Um, they're not an RCD, it's just a different, different type of capacity up there. 
So we've partnered with After the Fire, formerly known as Rebuild North Bay, and they have um, gone into contract with CAL FIRE. They are the grantees. So we are working with them as technical advisors to do outreach in the community. This program started out as a $1.5 million grant um, from Prop 68 funding. And CAL FIRE uh, just earlier this year gave us another 3.5 million to continue. Um, this will allow us to span, expand the reach of this program to landowners up to 5,000 acres. So between five and 5,000 acres, we can offer technical assistance and actual implementation dollars. It's a cost sharing program like EQIP, but we are targeting those four counties because we know that the prices for you know, any of the type of work that needs doing can be exponentially higher in, in some of these areas that, you know, setting a price for even the state of California, let alone the nation, is going to maybe not be as appropriate in the North Bay area. So we are also able to expand this program to include um, technical assistance in the form of, excuse me, forest management plans, which can be written by uh, us as RCDs or um, we can hire contracts, consultants to come out and, and satisfy the forest management plans. What we're trying to do here is, you know, target areas of active land ownership. We're not looking at, um, you know, recent wildfire, though it is one of the po points components. We're not necessarily looking, we're not looking at income at all. Um, what we're trying to do is really get out there and create healthy, sustainable forests. So it doesn't have to have been affected by fire. It can be pre-fire work. It can be post-fire work. It can be partnered with an existing EQIP contract. The contracts under this program are going to last for 12 months after they're signed. So, you know, we're trying to do sort of speedy, smaller bites maybe to start out with and then expanding. It is still very much a pilot program. We are actually in the process. Now that we've gotten this different monies of uh, evolving our points and criteria. So the current application cycle is closed. Like you can't submit an application right now, but it will open up again in early August. I highly encourage you to go to afterthefireusa.org slash NVFIP. We will, um, my contact information is there still obviously. And, and if you know people in Sonoma, Lake and Mendocino counties, there will be more information soon. We're working on it. Uh, we hope to have all of the current criteria up in July. So I'm just gonna get you, there's my contact information. Um, and if you, I am the forestry program manager for Napa County, but, or for Napa RCD, but I will be off on maternity leave in July, starting in July. So. Um, forestry at NapaRCD.org is another good email address. And with that, I will stop. Thanks, Amanda. This is good stuff. Thank you, uh, Erica, as well. I hope the folks here who who are, have forested land that are thinking about managing um, these are great programs, and I hope you become good friends with these folks because they're going to be really useful and powerful allies in helping you get this work done. Um, so let's move on, unless NRCS or RCD or any funding folks have anything else to say, I think we're going to move on to the Q&A session, which will include everything we've talked about. And then lastly, uh, you know, uh, before we start that, we'll introduce the, the rest of our, our, our experts on the, on the topic. And then uh, please remind me, folks, that we do have a um, field tour tied to this webinar series or to this webinar. Um, and I'll bring it up at the end and provide a registration link and, and we'll have some details for that workshop. So um, do um, can our Cal Fire folks join the conversation? You all want to introduce yourselves uh, however you see fit. Um, and then we'll start by going through the couple of chat questions and then open it up for, for, live, for live questions. I'm Chris Lee. I'm a forest health specialist for Cal Fire with uh, primary responsibility for the North Coast counties. But... Uh, you know, I, I, I work in um, Lake and Napa and some of the, the, the more inland counties as well in conjunction with my colleagues who are going to um, introduce themselves. Um, my name is 
Curtis Ewing. Um, I don't have a camera, so you can't see me, but I also am with CAL FIRE and I um, overlap in the Napa area with Chris Lee, though I'm more um, centered in the northern part of the state around Redding. And I'm Tom Smith. I'm also with Chris and Curtis with CAL FIRE and I'm based out of Sacramento. All right, well, thanks. Um, thanks for being here, guys. I appreciate your expertise in helping this conversation. Um, we had a couple of really good questions in the chat box. So we'll start with, I'll start with those. And then um, we, we have a, a, still have a decent number of participants. So if you all can help me look for raised hands, we'll make sure we try to get to live questions. But let's start with the chat questions. And um, the first thing that somebody asked, actually two people independently asked is, um, are there predators, natural predators of bark beetles? And I, I quickly responded in the chat box that, yeah, there's, there's a lot. There's woodpeckers, uh, predaceous insects, there's parasitoids, diseases, small mammals. Any other examples you all can think of? Yeah, I mean, the diseases would be um, fungi that can kill them. Um, but unfortunately, they don't have a very large effect on the population of the beetles. The main um, regulating force is always going to be the host tree, limiting their populations. Um, they kind of nibble at the edges, but they don't really impact the uh, population levels in any meaningful way. And people have been looking for biocontrol agents for over 100 years for these beetles, and no one has ever really found an effective means of biocontrol. Yeah, bio, biological control is the intentional introduction or release either from another range or, you know, um, facilitating populations of a natural predator and releasing them in, in, in outbreak areas to help control populations. But if you're a good predator, you're not going to make your host disappear. So yeah, they're very, you know, they don't eradicate outbreaks. They just help us kind of control them. Um, Chris, did you have something else to add? That covered it well. Okay. Um, somebody asked about species of woodpeckers that feed on bark beetles. Um, I'm, I'm no expert, but I, I have seen every kind of woodpecker that I can't, that I, I know of feeding on, they, any insectivorous woodpecker will go after bark beetles. They are just like free candy. Um, and there's some specialist woodpeckers that really enjoy uh, larva as insect larva as well. Um, but uh, any, Anybody have any comment about woodpeckers? They're just really cool. They do. They, there's really cool research showing that when you have bark beetle outbreaks or wildfire events that it facilitate insect outbreaks or insect populations build up, there's all these cool relationships where bark uh, woodpecker populations explode, and there's like this more fecundity and higher survival rates, and just kind of thrive in in those conditions as well. So that shows some of the the really important value of of bark beetles and part of the food web. Um. Let's see. Okay, next question. This is really good from James. Um, he asked if there's any commercial value to lumber killed by bark beetles. Um, any any products? I'll start with this one, and then maybe y'all can follow up. Um, so a question that I say a lot, and uh, that a lot of us here say, is it depends. And so what it depends on is if it's a commercially viable species. So for example, Douglas fir is. We have local market for it. So yeah, if you have a lot of Doug fir mortality. You can do what CAL FIRE calls a notice of timber operations um, or, or a categorical, categorical exemption, or in short, short uh, ling lingo is a salvage operation for dead dying to these trees. So you can salvage trees that are being killed or damaged bark, bark beetles. Um, it has to be done quickly because that material decays fairly fast once it's dead. Um, and a huge, you know, big asterisk next to this whole process is um, you have to have infrastructure to do it. You have to have a market for it. Um, you have to have the time and it has to be done in such a way that you're following the rules and regulations. So it, it can be done. Uh, you need a registered professional forester. So if you're interested in pursuing a timber operation to salvage dead dying disease trees, you're gonna need to talk to an RPF like Eric was mentioning. Um, and then, as I mentioned, it depends on your species because you have to have a market for it. So things like knob cone and, and gray pine, there's no market. and we don't really have a ponderosa pine market on the coast, uh, but if you get lucky and there's a strong market for it, maybe in the Sierra or somewhere else, you might be able to ship it. But that is very rare, especially with the cost of transportation right now. So, um, and it's also a timing factor. So if, if the trees die, you know, if you get to them quickly after they die, 
they don't decay as much and so there's more value but if you wait too long then there's no value and they're they're not really millable anymore so it's a complicated question that you um, certainly would need to talk to a forester about to to see if it's the right option for you um, the programs that we mentioned today are really fantastic programs for thinking about long-term forest health and creating sustainable resilient forest structure but you know they don't address the immediate emergency need that you could get through timber operation so um, that's something to think about if you have that option. Anything to follow up on that? I wanted to mention something, Mike. Um, just two resources that might be helpful. I'm going to put these links in the chat. One is that the California Board of Forestry keeps a roster of registered professional foresters with their contact numbers and their locations. And so I'll put a link to that. And the second is that the um, Forest Land Steward newsletter, which is um, produced by a collaboration of forestry educators in the state, um, comes out every so often, and that newsletter has a lot of good information, but it also always has a good contact list for forestry assistance specialists, no matter where you're located in the state, and that includes people like Mike, so I am going to put a link to that in the chat also. Great, thanks. Um, uh, there was a question about equip acreage minimum, minimums. I know, Erica, you addressed that during your talk. Can you just remind folks what, what the acreage requirements are for equip? Yeah, um, so there is no direct minimum requirement, but we cannot provide financial assistance within 100 feet of a structure on your property. So just something to keep in mind that if your property is very small, that that may be something to take into effect. And I'm happy to discuss payment rates. Sometimes the payment rate is just not worth the amount of paperwork that the program requires. So just something to keep in mind that we can discuss that all together and see what is the best option for you. Great, thanks. Um, this is a really good question that came up. So there's some chat about bay laurel and resprouting. We'll talk about that in a second because I wanna get, this is a good conversation for all of us. Um, and I'm just working through the chat. If anybody, if there's anybody has hands up, please um, let me know. It doesn't seem like anybody currently does, as far as I can tell. Um, but uh, oh, I lost it. Where is it? It was a good question. Oh, I got to find it. Um, okay, uh, with dead tree, you know, dead pine trees or dead conifers, uh, removal is the best. Yes, um, um, but while you're waiting for removal, and particularly during wildfire season. And this is a question for everybody because this is, a, I think, a good question we can have a conversation about. Is it preferable to leave the dead trees standing or to cut them down, even if they can't be removed? What are your thoughts? I'll jump in. I, I think I would, you know, assuming that we're not operating on red flag days, assuming that removal can be done safely or, or just, you know, taking it down can be done safely. Um, I think I would just continue operations as normal. If you are in the process of cutting trees down and bucking them up, I would continue to do that regardless of wildfire season. If there's, you know, risk of sparks or anything, um, just because of the type of wildfires we have, which tend to be heavy, you know, hot weather, wind driven, and those standing dead trees are, you know, they're just little matchsticks, especially with all those dry needles. So getting them out of the crown, breaking up the continuity. Yeah, that's, that's where I'd lean. Uh, this is Curtis Ewing. I, I would agree with that. And if at the very least, you can take off lower limbs to get rid of ladder fuels. Yeah. That would be a, a good minimal place to start. Yeah. Yeah. I, I for dead trees, I'm mixed. I think, I think there, as Amanda said, uh, both well, what Amanda and Curtis said is is perfectly fine. I think also you think about if you keep cutting trees down, they're dead. You're adding to the surface fuels, which will affect fire behavior. So there's a give and take in both senses of how you manage dead trees. Um, I would say though, for currently infested trees, getting those on the ground is much better than leaving them standing because yeah. that those bark beetles are still gonna be, even that tree dies, it's still gonna have enough moisture under the bark where they're feeding to keep supporting the growth of those populations. And so if you leave that tree standing, they can go through the whole life cycle 
remember these bark beetles grow, their populations grow really quickly. They have multiple generations. Some species have multiple generations. And so if you leave that tree standing, they can continue to develop. And so ideally you want to destroy it, but if you can't, at least you can get on the ground and buck it up so that you dry the tree out and it like suppresses some of the emergence from that tree. So I think it really depends on the condition of the tree, where the bark beetle populations are in it or not. And I think hazards and risks associated with leaving a standing tree, right? If it's a dead tree around the edge of your driveway over your house, you're gonna to wanna to put that on the ground. Uh, if it's out in the middle of the back 40, I think that's a place where you can decide what the value is in putting it on the ground now or waiting or how, if you're already doing operations, how you're gonna approach that. Uh, so I wanted to address one question that I saw flash by yeah. about symbiotic bacteria. And actually the bark beetles don't really have symbiotic bacteria of the um, beetles that Michael presented on only the Mediterranean oak borer has a true symbiotic bacteria that it carries around and then feeds on. But um, the Western pine beetle carries a number of um, very damaging fungi that may not be quite symbiotic, but they do carry them around, uh, the blue stain fungi. And in, ma in many or even maybe most cases, that is what actually kills the tree. So you get a blue stain. And this can easily be seen after the tree is cut as staining on, in the outer wood. But the other beetles, don't really have any symbiotic bacteria, just that one. Right. They're like hitching a ride. They're just kind of have co-evolved to hitch a ride with a bark beetle and that's how they get moved around. Um, so, you know, typically they're kind of saprophytic fungi or feeding on dead dying trees that are already kind of on their way out. Um, there's a question. Uh, what about a tree, a standing dead tree with no bark, few branches, no needles? That's a different story, right? So we do need snags as we call them and snags are a really important wildlife habitat. Uh, right now, I would argue that we probably have a plethora of snags on the landscape. So I still think you can probably remove a few of them if you needed to. But yeah, you do need, like I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, dead trees are really important. And so we're not trying to sanitize the forest by any means. We're just trying to you know, manage to some extent um, how many dead trees there are, where they are and, and kind of moving forward, how we're going to build resilience or health back into that forest system following a disturbance like this. Uh, um, this is Tom, Tom oh yeah, Smith. If I can add to that, that some of the research done in the interior west shows that once the trees have lost their needles, they're not as much of a hot uh, fire hazard. But I would just look at it for that individual tree. How much of a hazard is it? Is it near a building? Is it near a roadway? Is it near a power line? If it's in the middle of nowhere, leave it for wildlife, unless you're taking other trees down in the area. Yeah, that's great. All right, there's a couple of questions for Eric and Amanda. Um, specifically, if you could just real, Eric, if you could real briefly kind of what's the typical time frame for the, you know, maybe from submitting an application to receiving funds kind of typical process, how long that takes? Yeah, I see that question. Yeah, that's a great question. And it does change every year. And um, so I will just give a, an example for last year's, we had an application deadline um, in December, and we also had an application deadline in March. And so those were two kind of deadlines, depending on if you submitted before then you would be put in the next funding period. And so usually the, the deadlines would be in the winter and early spring, and then the funding would begin shortly thereafterwards in the late spring to early summer. So that, that's pretty typical. And then if your application does receive funding, like I mentioned in the uh, slideshow, you do have to wait sometimes several months for the biological and archeological review to be done. So it would just be like almost a hurry up and wait, but that is sometimes just how uh, we function. So, um, you know, just getting that, the application in is what, and getting us out for a site visit is what I would encourage initially. Great, thank you. Uh, Amanda, did you see a very similar question for, and it, and it says if, uh, if applications for NB FIP are next open in early August, when will the program tell applicants their app, whether the application has been accepted or not? Yeah, so we are currently operating NB FIP on six month cycles. So we had an application period close the end of March, and then another one will close the end of September. So you'll have a two month window early August to the end of September to submit an application um, and then we try and notify folks we try and like have our rankings and site sort of verifications which may or may not involve a visit 
um, done within the month. So you would know by the end of October if the application had been accepted for this next round. Um, this next round, we will also be accepting applications for forest management plans. So that the application is going to look different. If you filled out one in the past, just hang on to it. It's still useful information, but the official application that you can submit online will look different. We also, for folks that prefer to print things out, they can do that and bring it to me in, um, at the office. Awesome, thanks. Um, a couple more minutes, and there's a few random questions up here. One is about redwoods. Um, a couple of small groves of redwoods, less than 12 inch DVH were damaged in the fire. What can be done to aid survival, such as uh, something like watering or thinning? Any thoughts? I, I I I work in the redwoods a lot. They're weeds. If they're on on, if we call them what, growing within their natural range, not offsite, you know, they're pretty much going to be resilient and kind of persist through. Um, you can supplement a water. That you can thin out some of the more damaged trees. They're going to resprout like crazy. Any other thoughts? Any Chris, you you do redwood. You've been looking yeah. at a lot of fires I mean, too. Yeah. yeah, I agree that redwoods are kind of the the most tough resilient thing that we have out there and they're also although they kind of like to grow where there is water available they're surprisingly resilient to wildfire and they can look dead and then re-sprout later and surprise you and so um yeah i would say you don't have to really practice special care for them in most cases yeah unless they're ornamentals and then they're ornamentals and they're struggling no matter what so maybe removing them and planting a more suitable species where the site might be appropriate. But if you if you think about, I just saw an article come out from, from Big Basin and, and the CZU fire, and you know that park was hit really hard with fire. And I, don't, I think the numbers suggest that 97% of old growth redwoods survive. So they're what we call broad brushing or sprouting back. So these trees are really well fire adapted and kind of crazy alien weeds that it's really hard to kill a redwood. Um, there were some questions about sprouting like bay laurel, for example, and I think maybe we can just collectively have a conversation because it's all really relevant to, to disturbance, right, to post, post disturbance management and this can occur in wildfire bark beetles. You know, you kill the conifers, you're going to have, you know, all kinds of hardwoods and stuff sprouting in those spaces. But, um, you know, how do you deal with, with re-sprouting species and you're trying to control them? Um, herbicide, you know, hand pruning with herbicide is certainly is an option. Um, prescribed fire is something we haven't really talked about. We don't have a lot of time to talk about, but that is definitely a tool as well. Um, if you're trying to remove individual resprout clumps, and this can be, this is my opinion, and, and based on some some observational data, and maybe other folks here have ideas. But you know, pile burning on top of your your sprout, the stumps you just cut, is a really good way of killing individual trees to try to prevent resprouting, especially if you're trying to control bay laurel and and tan oak or other species like that that might be giving you some trouble. Um, any other ideas about sprouters? They're really difficult. It's that's something that you have to think about, not just post fire, but any kind of disturbance, right? If you're thinning for fuels reduction and you're thinning hardwoods and redwoods that re sprout, that means that part of the really important part of the management is the maintenance, the so long term vegetation maintenance, because a lot of this vegetation is going to come back real quick. Um, I, yeah, would, you know, I would add about bay laurel, I would just add that it's it ranks right up there with redwood in that re-sprouting capability. And we have done things in the past where we were trying to control bay laurels and girdling them will not work if they're large um, bay laurel trees. Um, and in order to control the sprouts, you have to basically kill the whole root system, which is can be very difficult to do. You can definitely do it through chemical means um, if that's the route you choose to go. And if you choose non-chemical means, persistence is key. Yeah. Didn't your, in that study, didn't your tano graft across the girdle as well? That was the bay laurels, actually, that, that did was, that. So, yeah, we there, made yeah. a very large girdle around the stems of several bay trees. And in some of them, we even cut deeply into the stem like a beaver would. And um, it didn't phase the trees at all. They just grew new tissue from the bottoms and the tops of those cuts and made bridges of, of living tissue across them and just kept living. That's amazing. Really tough tree. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, I think we got through most of the questions that are there. A couple of last things to say. Um, first of all, I want to thank Tracy and Tuesday, who really, um, you know, y'all made this happen. So thank you for organizing it. Um, 
And Chris mentioned the Forest Stewardship Newsletter. I want to mention that we also, in extension, are hosting a Forest Stewardship Workshop Series um, where we help private landowners understand the process of writing a forest management plan, understand the rules and regulations and what forestry is in California. And ultimately, the workshop culminates with us trying to help you connect with a professional, a resource professional, so an RPF. And we offer a stipend for that, that initial site visit. I'm going to post the link to the website where the material is hosted. Our next workshop that we're hosting is going to be in Lake County and it's starting at the end of June. And so if you're really interested about, you know, looking at EQIP or, or CFIP, which we didn't really talk about, which is another cost sharing incentive from CAL FIRE um, or the North Bay Forest Improvement, this is certainly a really valuable class to help you start understanding if you're interested in, in developing a management plan or, or kind of thinking long-term goals and strategies of your for your for your for your forest land. Um, so last thing that we have to mention is um, there is a field day associated with tonight's talk uh, that Curtis and Chris and maybe Tom, I'm not sure, but um, and some other folks will be helping to, to talk about and look at the things that we, we, we discussed tonight. Um, I have a link for registration. So we're, it's gonna be capped number of folks for in-person because we wanna be thoughtful about COVID and we have limitations on space and access. Um, I forgot all the information about it. I know it's on Sunday. I, forget, I don't know what the date is. I totally forgot. I think that's the sixth. Fifth. 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 Okay. So it's on the fifth. Um, what and what time is it? Is it, are we are we going to? Uh, is it hosted for? I think we decided at like two hours nine to eleven. Okay. So what we'll do is I'll post the the registration link right now. If you want to register. Um, then we'll follow up with a, um, a logistics email on where to meet and when to meet. We're gonna the, the, the we're still working out those details, and so we won't can't really specify at this point. Um, but it's gonna be really cool to look at areas that have been managed that aren't being managed, and look at the mortality and talk about and, and see in person a lot of stuff that we talked about. And I, I want to throw in there. I think that um, the focus is the Angwin area, and I. Th think um, because there's a limitation on the number of people specific to like parking and ex you know accessibility um, we definitely encourage if you can like carpool with a neighbor if there are several of you going like really think about kind of the logistics and the impacts that we might have to whatever area we descend upon yeah that'd be, I, that'd be great one and then I have one question I got online or actually through my email. Um, Mike, what do you think about the turnaround time for this webinar? When could it be available and how can we share it widely? Yeah, I will. So we did record, as we mentioned, I'll do my best to kind of edit the video tomorrow and then send a link out. Um, I'll post it on my UC YouTube page and then send the link out to everyone. It should be hopefully live sometime this week, maybe tomorrow or by the end of the week. Awesome. I just want to, I want no, to jump in and promote what Mike, the um, workshop Mike was talking about, the Forest Stewardship Workshop. The next one is in Lake County, but there will be a NAFPA-oriented one in January. So we will be heavily involved in that and are really looking forward to it. And we'll be looking for you know sites to visit and speakers and um, probably tapping into a few of you because I recognize your name. <laughs> Thanks for reminding me, man. I totally forgot. Even though I'm on the steering committee and I organized, I, I said, I want Lake and then Napa. I totally forgot that I said Napa. So yeah, that's coming down the pike. Um, we, well, that's that's all I have. Is there anybody else who wants to provide any, any comments, any last minute thoughts? I'm going to post the link to my website. If you have any resources you want to share, um, put them in the chat box for folks to take a look at. There was a there's a long question that I see Chris responded to. Email me. I'll put my email here. That's a whole conversation for a site visit and a whole different day. So, um, I would uh, just chime in and say um, thanks to all the attendees who are interested, who kind of watch this. Be sure to share it with your friends. Thank you for your questions and a, a, a special thanks to the whole panel of experts that we had speaking on this topic. It's um, it's definitely something that is kind of at the forefront of everyone's mind, especially landowners who are trying to figure out what to do. So super appreciate like the collaboration and the webinar itself. I thought it was excellent. So thank you, everyone.
Thanks for making it happen. You guys, you and Tuesday pull us together and got us all here. So I appreciate it. Absolutely. Yeah, thanks. All right, that's all. If, if anybody has any lingering questions, feel free to ask. Otherwise, we're done. And thank you for your time. And we look forward to working with you or talking in the future. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Thank you.